everybody, welcome back to the Medical Projects YouTube channel. If you are new around here, hello, my name is Olivia. I'm a second year medical student at King's College London. And here on the Medical Projects YouTube channel, we upload videos every single week, offering the best tips and bits of advice to ensure that you get your dream place at medical school. And I'm here to show you what medical school is really like. So if you like the sound of that, please do make sure you have subscribed to our YouTube channel, turn on the notification bell so that you can be sure to be notified when we post. And as ever, if there's anything you'd like us to cover in a future video, do let us know in the comments down below. We've also got a new camera, so do let us know how you're liking the quality. I would love to know. I'm really excited, still getting a bit used to how to use it, so please do bear with me. For today's video, of course, it is interview season, so we really want to be churning out those videos which we think are really high yield and are gonna be really informative and help you guys perform to the best of your ability in your interview. So today I thought I'd cover medical ethics, and this is a huge topic. If you've already started researching for prep for your interview, you probably know it's an absolute minefield, but there are some core principles that you really need to get the hang of, and they're the things that we are going to be covering in today's video. I do recommend you supplement this with a very short introduction to medical ethics, which is an Oxford handbook, which I think was absolutely fantastic in my own interview preparation, and that will definitely supplement today's video. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the four pillars of medical ethics. We're also going to be talking about consent, how it can be obtained and why we want to obtain it. And we're also going to be talking about capacity, how this varies based on your age group and also how this varies if you are a child under 16. And I'm going to be briefly touching upon Gillick competence and Fraser guidelines. So without further ado, let's go on with the video. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the four pillars of medical ethics. So these are basically the things that we need to be thinking about as doctors to inform all our decisions when it comes to treating a patient. Sometimes we will be faced with very difficult ethical dilemmas that challenge our own beliefs. And in order to make sure that we are dealing with these in an appropriate and standardized way, using the medical ethics to inform our decisions is really important. So these are as follows. The first principle is that of autonomy. And what we mean by this is the patient has the right to decide. They should be able to have a choice over their medical intervention, be it surgery or even simple things like taking some tablets. They should be able to have a choice and voice their opinion. And despite our own beliefs, if a patient has refused and they have capacity to refuse, we should not push a treatment onto a patient because if we do, that would be considered battery. So for example, I might offer a patient an immunization and say, you know, we recommend that you get this flu jab every year. And they might say to me, I really don't want it. And that is fine. As long as they are informed and they've made that decision of their own volition, I can't do anything about it. And if I were to go up to them and quickly sneakily jab them, I would be breaking the law. The next principle of medical ethics is that of beneficence. And that is we should give the treatment that will benefit the patient the most. We should always have the best possible outcome in the forefront of our mind and we should treat them accordingly. This doesn't necessarily mean offering treatment. It can sometimes mean withdrawing treatment. For example, if we think that this patient is unfortunately going to pass away and ventilation is no longer an effective option and we think that that is doing more harm than good, we might choose to withdraw treatment. The next principle is that of non-maleficence and this essentially means that we should be doing no harm, which is what the Hippocratic Oath is all about. This means that we need to constantly be quantifying the risk to the patient when it comes to any medical intervention. So for example, although a surgery might be really successful, it might only have a 20% success rate and instead an 80% chance that the patient might really suffer, in which case we might choose not to go ahead with a surgery because it poses more harm than good. When we consider non-maleficence, we also do have to think about the idea of neglect and not acting in a timely manner and the patient suffering because of that is just as bad as intervening with a bad medical intervention. And finally, the last pillar we need to consider is that of justice. And what we mean by this is, is the treatment we are providing fair? And this one is quite tricky to get your head around because it kind of encompasses a lot of different things. So the first thing you need to consider is, are we allocating the resources to the correct person? So for example, in the context of an organ transplant, if you have two eligible recipients and only one organ, we really need to be considering where we allocate that organ. And in order to do that, you'd have to consider all the pillars of medical ethics and you'd also be involving a multidisciplinary team. So to summarize what I've said, there are four pillars of medical ethics and you should have these in your mind when it comes to discussing any ethical dilemma that you are to get in your interview be it who should get the organ, or it might be disclosing information and breaking confidentiality. But if you think out loud during your interview and you say, you know, we need to consider 
justice, non-maleficence, beneficence and autonomy, you're going to be along the right lines and you're going to really impress the examiner. In the next part of the video, I'd like to talk about the idea of consent, why it's important we obtain it, how we can obtain it and what happens if we can't obtain consent. So consent is basically a form of agreement from the patient that they are happy to receive any form of medical intervention and consent needs to be obtained before we do anything be it a physical examination an injection a surgery we always need to be obtaining consent from the patient because it strengthens the doctor patient relationship and it maintains the trust between the doctor and the patient when we think about consent consent can actually be given in many different ways although it is worth pointing out that the best possible way of giving consent is of course by verbally expressing your wishes to a doctor the next way we might obtain consent is through a written form. So for example, before a surgery, you often have to sign a form to say, I understand the risks of the surgery, but I'm willing to proceed anyway. And finally, there is also a form of consent called implied consent. This is a bit of a gray area and I would always suggest trying to acquire verbal consent, but there are scenarios where implied consent is very common. So for example, you might say to a patient, is it okay if I take your blood pressure reading today? And they might start rolling up their sleeve and hold out their arm to you. And we would consider that to be implied consent because although they haven't verbally said to us, yes, I consent to having my blood pressure taken, they're obviously making a move to allow you to do so. Now, when we think about consent, we need to think about the validity of this consent. In other words, can we truly accept the consent from this patient. And in order to come to that conclusion, the patient must fulfill three separate bits of criteria. Firstly, the patient must be informed. There's no point just saying to them, you're gonna have this surgical intervention, it will probably save your life. That's not going to be helpful. They need to be informed on the risks and benefits of any proposed medical intervention before they give their consent. The next thing is that the consent must be given voluntarily. It can't be due to external pressures from the doctor or the family. And finally, the last thing is that the patient must be deemed to have capacity to consent and that is something we're going to talk about in the next part of the video. So to summarise what I've just said about consent, we need to obtain it before any medical intervention. It's best to obtain this verbally although there are means of obtaining it through a written record or through implied consent. And finally for consent to be valid the patient must be informed, it must be offered voluntarily and they must have capacity to consent to the treatment. So finally for the last part of this video we're going to be talking about capacity capacity. And in lay terms, when we think about does a patient have capacity, what we mean is are they in the right mental frame of mind to be able to consider their treatment options and make a decision on that based on the information presented to them. And the way we assess this is using the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 and it states that in order for someone to be deemed to have capacity, they must be able to firstly understand the information that is being presented to them and this means that you might have to present information in a different way so for example if a patient is deaf you may not be able to verbally communicate about a surgical intervention you're about to perform secondly they need to be able to retain the information for a long enough period of time that they're able to make a decision they need to be able to weigh up their options so understand the risks and benefits of a surgery or a treatment or a medication they're about to go on and finally they must be able to communicate their decision back to you. So to summarise, in order for a patient to be deemed to have capacity, we use the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 and that states that a patient must be able to understand the information, retain the information, weigh up the information and communicate their decision back to you. Now something that needs to be noted about capacity is just because, for example, I have capacity today, it doesn't mean that I necessarily will tomorrow. And so we need to be constantly assessing the capacity of a patient. So imagine I presented to A&E and I was so, so, so drunk that I was completely incoherent and the doctor just couldn't understand me at all. I had no idea where I was, no idea what was going on. I would be deemed not to have capacity to consent to treatment. But that doesn't mean that the next day I wouldn't have my capacity restored. So let's think of scenarios where a patient may be deemed not to have capacity to consent to treatment. Well, of course, if you're unconscious, you're not going to have capacity to consent to treatment because, well, you're passed out. You may also not have capacity if you are intoxicated or using any drugs. You may also not have capacity if you have a mental health disorder or psychological disorder that severely impairs your capacity. So for example, with Alzheimer's. And finally, often you may deemed not to have capacity if you are a child under 16. And that is where we are going to talk about the different age groups and how that relates to capacity. So in general, if you are aged 18 plus, 
you are assumed to have capacity unless proven otherwise because you are an adult and that means in general you have the capacity to make decisions about your treatment, you can accept treatment and you can refuse treatment. If you are of the age between 16 and 17, you can consent to treatment in a similar way that an adult can. However, if you are refusing life-saving treatment, this can be overruled either by a parent or by a court. So for example, let's consider a patient who has leukemia and she has been offered chemotherapy and she says, I don't want it. I, I just feel so sick when I have it. I don't want to continue it anymore. We might think that that decision is not in her best interest. So we would consult the parents and the parents might say, you know what, she needs to have this chemotherapy. It is going to save her life. And in that case, we would not abide by the decision made by the patient and we would go ahead with that treatment because both the parents and the doctor think that this treatment is in the best interest of the patient. If you are under 16, this becomes a little trickier because of course you're not deemed to be an adult. And in this case, we use something called Gillick's competence, which you'll often hear about in conjunction with Fraser guidelines, which I'm about to cover. So when we're thinking about Gillick's competence, this is basically a framework where we're able to decide whether we think a child has the necessary information and capacity to consent to treatment. And one thing to say about Gillick's competence is again, this varies based on the scenario. So for example, we might think that a patient who is 15 has capacity to consent to a vaccination they're going to receive. And in that case, we would say, this patient is Gillick competent, even though they're 15, to consent to a vaccination. But we would question their competency in more complex medical scenarios. And in which case we would look to the parents to consent on their behalf. And if we didn't think that the parents were acting in their best interests, we would take this to court. So a classic example, which you might hear about in interviews is that of Jehovah's Witnesses who do not believe in having blood transfusions. If we had a very young child, we would probably assume that they didn't have capacity to consent to a blood transfusion, in which case we would go to their parents who would also probably reject the notion of a blood transfusion due to their own religious beliefs. These situations are extremely complicated, even for qualified professionals, and in this circumstance we might choose to take it to court. Now when we talk about Fraser guidelines, this refers to the provision of contraceptives and sexual health advice to those under 16. So the House of Lords said that a child could be offered contraceptives or sexual health advice if they met the following criteria. And I'm going to read these out from my phone because they're quite long. So the first one is that he or she has sufficient maturity and intelligence to understand the nature and implications of the proposed treatment. The second criteria is he or she cannot be persuaded to tell her parents or to allow the doctor to tell them. The third is that he or she is very likely to begin or continue having sexual intercourse with or without contraceptive treatment. The fourth is that his or her physical or mental health is likely to suffer unless he or she received the advice or treatment. And the fifth is that the advice or treatment is in the young person's best interests. So to summarize that, it's basically, if we have a patient that is coming to us and we are worried that if we withhold contraceptives or sexual health advice, they are going to be in harm's way, we would provide treatment, providing that they meet these five bits of criteria. Of course, in such scenarios, it's really important that we try and encourage the patient to share this information with their parents or legal guardians. So finally, let's consider what to do if we think a patient doesn't have capacity. This might be because they're in a coma or they have a severe neurodegenerative disorder, for example. The first thing we can do is look to see if this patient has an advanced directive. And this is basically a document they have written when they had capacity, where they have expressed their medical wishes. So they might have written when they had capacity, if in the case of a cardiac arrest, please do not resuscitate me. And that means sadly, if they did suffer a cardiac arrest, we would abide by their wishes. If a patient does not have an advanced directive, we might look to see if they have a lasting power of attorney. And this is where a patient has appointed someone to act on their behalf and in their best interests. So for example, if we consider a patient who is getting very sick, they might appoint their son to make decisions in their best interest when they no longer have capacity. Now we can override this if we think that the appointed person is not acting in the best interest of the patient. Finally, if none of that exists and it's in an emergency situation, we need to act in the best interests of the patient. And that is essentially what the Hippocratic Oath is all about. We always want to benefit the patient and avoid doing any harm wherever possible. So if we were in a scenario where none of these medical interventions existed and we needed to have a medical intervention stat, 
we would act in the best interests of the patient. And that usually involves informing seniors, having a multidisciplinary team meeting and discussing the risks and benefits of any proposed intervention. So to summarise, capacity is something that needs to constantly be assessed and the assumption of capacity really varies depending on which age group you fall into, especially if you are under 16, in which case we need to abide by Gillick competence and Fraser guidelines when it comes to sexual health. If a patient doesn't have capacity to consent to a treatment, we might look to see if they have a lasting power of attorney or an advanced directive and if none of that exists we would simply act in their best interests. It is always important to involve lots of different people when it comes to making these very complicated decisions and sometimes these might even be taken to court. So that was quite an information dense video and it is quite complicated to get your head around but if you can remember and discuss some of the core principles that I've spoken about in today's video you're going to be absolutely set for your interview. So I thought as a bit of a fun thing to end the video I would present you with an ethical dilemma and we could have a bit of of a conversation in the comments down below. Also, we are offering some fantastic virtual MMI prep, so do make sure to check out the link in the description box if you want a mock MMI interview. I definitely recommend checking this out if you want to see what an MMI might truly look like, especially because it is all virtual this year. And you'll also receive some fantastic feedback from some of our experts so that you know where to improve for the real thing. Please do make sure you like this video, share it with any of your friends that you think might find it useful, and do make sure you have subscribed to our channel and turn the notification bell on. I'm going to leave you with the ethical scenario to discuss in the comments and I'd love to get involved with you guys so make sure you offer your thoughts and opinions down in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in next week's video. Bye!